on? Cool. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Awesome. Hi, I'm Amy. Can I get a show of hands if you have watched a YouTube video in the last 48 hours? I'll assume you were busy yesterday. Cool. Keep your hands up if you remember who made that video. Keep your hands up if you finished it. <laughs> this is what's wrong with YouTube. And we're going to talk about that today, okay? There's hope. There's hope. We're going to fix that for you guys. So obviously, we need to talk about why YouTube. There's a very obvious answer of the second largest search engine only to adopted mommy Google, right? That's a pretty good reason to be on YouTube. You're also 53 times more likely to appear in search with video content. That's not just because you're on YouTube or any video platform. That's having video on your website. That is what search engines want to see. You're also keeping visitors on your site five times the average rate. Again, referring to the website. Great reason to be on YouTube, but great reason for video as a whole. And you're also going to make consumers more confident about their online purchases, which I think we all would like to see more happen if we sell online. We want them to feel confident about what they're buying, and video helps accomplish that. Before I start with anything, I like to share my favorite quote because I am a true YouTuber, okay? I started from my bedroom with a point-and-shoot camera, and I've only upgraded the camera. I'm still in a bedroom, so. <laughs> you always need to remember to do what you can with what you have where you are. Theodore Roosevelt, I don't know if you guys know, best video blogger of all time. So really want to take notes from him, okay? Let's go over what we're going to talk about today, the five steps. First, your goals. Shocker. I'm going to make you make some decisions first. It's not all tips and tricks. Next, we're going to talk, to talk about addictive video. What is the format that actually keeps people coming back to watch your videos? We'll also discuss what to talk about, how to never have a blank slate. I'm sure you all have dealt with this before, creating a piece of content thinking, oh, what are we going to do today? What are we going to blog about today? What are we going to Instagram today? What are we going to do a video about? It should always be very clear what you're going to do next based on your format. Optimize, optimize, optimize. Why are we on YouTube? Because of search. So we need to go through the necessary SEO opportunities. And then community. YouTube and its viewers, this community is the best you'll ever have online, period. They will go to the end of the earth for you as a brand if you bring them what they want with your content. So let's talk about your goals. Has anyone ever seen this video? <laughs> Sneezing Baby Panda, best video of all time, okay? If you haven't seen it, let me give you the play-by-play. -play. Mama Panda is just chilling, she's just eating. Something. Baby panda is sleeping, right? Baby panda wakes up and sneezes. The craziest sneeze you've ever heard in your life and shocks mama. End of video. <laughs> that is the best 16 seconds. Seriously, it's the best video. But this is not your goal. This beautiful Photoshop work that I did here, <laughs> These views, that's not your goal. That's not what we're trying to do. You're not coming to me and saying, how do we go viral, guys? Like, I need to make this happen. We need to just go viral. This is not your goal. This guy agrees. Cute stock photo boy. No. No. These are your, these are your goals. Ideally, you will have a valuable editorial plan followed by organic brand advocacy in addition to clear and align calls to action. So many people get started with video and they don't ask for the relative return that you now have the ability to ask for. So I'm giving you permission, but you have to have the first two as well. Let's break it down. Valuable editorial plan. Give the people what they want. I know you guys have a lot of big plans about what you want to put in your YouTube content that you think your audience is going to be so into, but you need to think about what they want before they're going to even give you the opportunity to talk about what you think they need. So being very in tune to who your audience is and what they want 
is how you're gonna win on YouTube. Audience retention is the most critical metric. I don't know if anyone's noticed, but YouTube not only talks about views, they also talk about minutes watched now. Have you guys seen this metric? There's a good reason for that, because when you have viewers on to continue watching your content, more minutes watched, they're making more money. That makes sense, right? So if you have good audience retention, which means, let's take the example from earlier, you all started watching a video, you might remember who made it because you searched for something or you saw it on your feed, and then you maybe finished it. The ideal situation is we're getting people to stick around for a good percentage of the video. Google and YouTube take notice of that, and you will reap the benefits in turn by keeping people on your content. Stay consistent with format and expectations. YouTube, shockingly like television. We like knowing what's coming, but also being pleasantly surprised. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Organic brand advocacy, what does this mean? You are invited to the conversation, so don't drop the mic. We're gonna talk about YouTube comments later. This is a big issue in this area. We wanna publish the content and then watch it fly without actually helping it along. And it's very, very important that if you want the brand advocacy that these amazingly loyal viewers can offer you, that you help them with this by not leaving the conversation when you start it. Give your top fans the credit they deserve. There are gonna be some people out there that we might wanna call creepers, but they might also be like the most loyal viewers you'll ever have. Let those people work hard for you and give them credit. Also, active comments include the creator. I've already harped on that. I'm gonna talk about that like a lot, so prepare for that. <laughs> Clear and aligned calls to actions. Give value and ask for relative return. We're not gonna do a video about how to create a souffle and then ask for the viewer to hire you as their personal chef. Not relative return, right? But you do have the right to ask for value in return for the value that you have given. So what can you do there and how do you call that action as relevantly as possible? Your audience wants to do something with the value you've shared. So let them and tell them what to do. What moves the needle for you? Tell them what that is. Graphics only might be seen. Call the action. We all love our little end slates and title sequences, right? Look how pretty it is. It says to subscribe to the channel, so maybe they will. No, they won't. I don't know the last time you watched a video. Maybe the time I asked you when you watched one in the last 48 hours and you opened up the tab on your desktop and possibly opened up another tab, checked your email, maybe opened up another tab because you gotta know what's going on on Facebook at the exact same time. And you're still listening. But are you gonna see that graphic? No, but you might make it to the end of the video, which is gonna make it okay. <laughs> but if you don't call the action, there's a very good chance they're not gonna take it. This is when I like to bring in my favorite little thing called a social funnel. It's important to know that every single platform you're on has a place and a call to action in line with it. Can you skip this process? Sure, I think we're seeing that with live streaming. There may be a lot less to this funnel than the usual, but you should always plan your call to action accordingly. You hanging out at the cocktail party that is Twitter, get them to your content. Get them to your content on your website. You're on the website, you have complete control of the real estate. Get them on your email list. Build the database. I may be a true YouTuber, but I also do business. And I know my YouTube subscribership number is pretty, but it is not how I make a living. I need to have a place where those people are hanging out with me and me alone, and that is my list. So it's very important to keep your social funnel in mind. So what makes video addictive? Does anyone know who this is? Oh, gosh. Mr. Rogers, you just knew what he was gonna do, right? He comes on, he takes off his jacket, he's singing to you, he puts his sweater on, you know this trolley's gonna show up at some point, right? And you learn something. But you know what you're gonna get every single time. Does that ring a bell? 
okay, maybe this is a little bit more relatable. Does anyone watch Scandal? Right? What do we know about this? Olivia Pope is going to show up with a fabulous outfit, an amazing Prada bag, and she's going to save the day every time, whether she's broken or not, and possibly kiss the president after. We know that, right? We know that. There are things like this that matter, even on YouTube. This is your structure. This is your brand. This is what makes it addictive, makes people want to come back. What is it that people can predict about you that they're like, oh man, I know Amy's going to be standing in front of that Ikea bookshelf with all those stupid pillows and stuff, and she's going to give me a tip, and I know I'm going to be able to execute as soon as I leave. That's what people know about me. What do they know about you? Vogue does a really nice job of this, just to give you a good example of a, a bigger brand on YouTube. It's all behind the scenes, access to whoever's in their magazine, and they're professionally casual. Context of platform. This is YouTube. Sneezing baby panda, okay? People are going to hang out. They're going to watch cat videos. They might watch my videos. They might watch Vogue's videos. So if you're going to end up on any one of these channels, you remember the frame of mind people are in when they're hanging out on YouTube. They just want to hang. They just want to have fun. And if you can give them a good time and possibly a takeaway in turn, they're in. They're addicted. This is a very good example to look at. Branding structure. Scheduled consistency. This doesn't always mean the same day of the week. It helps. It's more memorable. But it doesn't have to be. But if you are not consistent on YouTube, you will not build a following, period. They're waiting to be loyal to you. So you have to give them something to be loyal to. There are channels that only publish once a quarter. It's movie theater quality, so that's their excuse. And it makes sense, but I turn the camera on and ramble on for three minutes, so I can make three videos a week. And I picked my three days. But being scheduling-wise consistent is very important on YouTube. Predictable themes. Just go BuzzFeed on it, right? How can we make this fun? OK, I've done Sexy Wednesday, right? How, we can do Recipe Friday. Give people something that they can remember. And this is not just for the audience. It doesn't even have to be public. It can just be for you. Your brand needs these buckets in place in order to always have something to talk about. The blank slate, it doesn't matter how big your company is, is daunting. So give yourself places to fill in the blanks. Connection through familiarity, branding. Get them hooked. Always consider context of platform. I already talked about this. Uh, this was something mentioned also, I think, in Jab, 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 Right Hook by Gary Vaynerchuk. He kind of made the context conversation Super fun to talk about. It's so important. We're not copying our Facebook statuses over to Twitter anymore because we know it doesn't work. And why doesn't it work? Because they're different platforms. So you have to take into consideration YouTube and the context of the platform is very important for your content. Bucket editorial with predetermined themes. I just talked about that. Define the consistent setting for the channel. People like to know where you're going to be. You can change it up. That makes it fun. But if you can stay consistent, this is a great piece to having a YouTube channel people are really, really addicted to. Timing is everything. So let me expand on timing. This is what I call the YouTube video formula. When it comes to an informational video, this is your guide. It doesn't matter if you're on your smartphone and you're going to upload straight to the platform, no editing, or you're going to go all out fancy. This is going to help you have the best project every single time. Subject first. What does that mean? Well, if the feature of your video is a person talking, that person needs to be at the zero second mark especially if it's a person, because that personal connection is the reason you're doing this in the first place. So don't hide the person that's going to take us through this process. An example of something on the other end of the spectrum would possibly be tech review. 
If you're a hand model reviewing the latest phone, the phone should be the first thing in the first frame. Prove you've got it. Step ahead of the competitors that are saying they're reviewing the phone, but are really just reviewing it from a website. Show you have it, show it's hands on, subject first. That is the first step to getting somebody to say, I'm gonna keep watching this video. Loyalty treatment. This always kind of gets people a little held up. I don't introduce myself in any one of my videos. I have a graphic for that. It says my name, and my name's complicated anyway. Why am I gonna bother saying it so many times? I treat my audience like they're loyal, so that they will be. It's the first time they watch a video, they're like, who is this? I don't care. Get the information that you want, how you ended up here, you'll be begging to know my name by the end of the video, because I'm gonna get you to the end of the video. And this comes in very handy when somebody lands on my channel and says, I watched one video, and then I watched 300 more. Can you imagine if I introduced myself every single time? The other end of the spectrum would be announcing yourself is more of a shtick. That's a complete you know, judgment call on your brand side. But for the most part, just assume they know you, they love you, and they're gonna come back. And when you do, you are saving the most critical seconds of this timeline. Speaking of that, you have an average of eight seconds for somebody to decide whether they're gonna stay for the duration or not. That's when a lot of you guys were lost on that video you watched in the last 48 hours. You start watching, you say, oh, is this what I thought it was? You know, the headline said Justin Bieber leak, and this isn't looking like it's actually a Justin Bieber leak, so I'm gonna go, right? I know you guys can relate to that. You all listen to, to, to JB, right? No. That is why you have eight seconds, because there are so many people doing videos that are not what they say they are. So, prove that you're doing it. Don't waste any time. The best part should be at the beginning. Don't worry about your title sequence, that beautiful graphic masterpiece that you had created, it's 15 seconds long, probably has your logo floating around on a beach somewhere. Nobody cares, nobody wants to watch that. If you've watched TV lately, is there any TV show left, I'm really trying to figure this out, that actually does a full-blown, this is the happy show, and here's who it stars, and here's all the credits. They don't do that anymore. You are so far into the content before you even see maybe a logo go across the screen. TV is on point with this, so we should be too. That's a big deal. Don't worry about the long title sequences. When you look at the camera, it is your ideal customer, audience, viewer, client. Until you look at a camera like it's a person, a very specific, defined person, you're not gonna be good on camera. Whoever your personality is, they're gonna look at it like it's a device, and let's get real, talking to a device is a little stupid. But if you're talking to the camera, like it's a person, the person you're here to help. That's what makes somebody good on camera. At the end of your video, you need to make sure you factor time for the close. If it's gonna be three minutes of content, then make sure you save yourself 30 seconds to say, hey, this has been Savvy Sexy Social. Thanks for being here, my name's Amy. You should subscribe to this channel. We have fun Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. So obviously, hang out. Make sure you factor in that time and stay very focused on what that call to action is. Call it, say it, don't just display it. I just came up with that, somebody tweet that. <laughs> it's so important that you call the action because they will take it, but you have to tell them to. And sometimes we forget that in marketing. We're trying to be so fun and exciting and different and we don't call the action because we were trying to be the cool kid. The rest of this makes you the cool kid. Call the action. And then finish up in about five minutes, ideally. If it's a tutorial, you have permission to go longer than that. But you should need every single minute of that video, every single second. Don't waste the first couple minutes introducing yourself and, and talking about things that are not relevant to the content. 
because if you take a look at your competition, the people that you're trying to rank against in search, if they got it done in less than five, your six minute video is going to suffer, period. Do you wanna make the front page of search? Have the shorter video. What should we talk about? You never wanna have a blank slate. Use your themes to guide editorial. You need to come up with basic buckets of what people want to know about your content. You can say, oh, we wanna help people with cooking at home. Okay, great, all right. That's, a, that's broad, that's very broad. So be a specialist in a couple of different areas and allow those areas to guide your editorial design. There are no stupid questions, only in-demand content. If you hear a question a lot, people are Googling it. Am I right? Yes, I am right. You can say it. <laughs> Listen to your audience. They will tell you exactly what they want. This is why the YouTube comments are so critical. This is why social is so critical. This is why any way to reach out to you whatsoever is so critical and you need to be paying attention to it. They will tell you, but they will also tell you in different ways. They don't have to tell you directly. And we're gonna talk about how you can look into that. Does anyone know what this, by the way, I just love this picture of Matthew Hussey. He's so beautiful. So does anyone know what this drop down is here? Popular searches. Exactly. YouTube, Google, predictive search. How to create, how to create a YouTube channel, how to create a website, how to create an app, how to create channel art, how to create a logo, how to create a Minecraft server. I don't know about you, but there are a few options here that are fair game. They're a little broad, that's okay. What is so important about this? YouTube is blatantly telling you what the most popular searches are for that phrase. Right there. If anything here applies to your brand, raise your hand. There are options here, and they're just right in front of you. You have to test it out. Instant search results are possible searches that you see based on what other people are searching for and the content of web pages indexed by Google. Good information. And I don't do SEO, but this works for me. Leverage the access that you have and do something different. You know what people want to hear about. You know what people want, to t want you to talk about. So take the opportunity to leverage what you have and make content about it. I know that my audience wants to know what top YouTubers are doing to make connections and build relationships and get sponsorships. So. I go to the Consumer Electronics Show, I put two all-star tech reviewers on camera, and instead of asking them about what their favorite thing is on the show floor this year, like everyone else is, I'm going to ask them what they're doing to network themselves, which ends up being the most hilarious video of being uncomfortable about who brought business cards or not. Everybody's different, that's the information I'm trying to pull out. These are personal brands. My audience is aspiring personal brands. Therefore, they want this information. Exclusive content. Fill your buckets, leverage your access, and create something that's not out there. Optimize. The most critical steps for better SEO are a few areas on YouTube. You can do a lot of things, but these are the three critical things. Headline, description, tags. When you do your predictive search, your research, your exclusive content plan, figure out what your keyword phrase is. You need to know it backwards and forwards before you even make the video, but definitely, if not before, it, you must know it before it's actually on YouTube, the platform. Here's why. There are these three sections. When you have the, he the keyword in all three of these sections, that and only that will help you get on the front page of search on YouTube for that phrase, if you have a fighting chance. Hopefully you do. And there are things that can help you, even if it's highly competitive. But it is very important that all three of those fields are filled in before the video is done processing. 
What happens after upload time, processing time? YouTube is trying to figure out what your video is about so it can hurry up and categorize it, and move on to the next one. So are you really going to leave this blank and go to dinner to come back and then fill it in? Don't lose that opportunity. The first 24 hours of a YouTube video are the most critical. In your headline, your keyword should be at the beginning, ideally in the first four to five words. This is because when you look at search, you often see ellipses because people can't get to their point early enough. I would like your keyword to be before that ellipse happens and then it's not even a factor. It needs to be at the beginning, not just for search, but also for your audience. They wanna see it. Avoid series names and episode numbers. This is what Gary Vee is doing wrong, in my opinion. The Ask Gary Vee Show, if you're familiar with it, he puts Ask Gary Vee at the beginning of every headline. He's ranking fabulously for Gary Vee, I can tell you that. But that's what that's accomplishing. So for the purpose of discovery, not really helping the average brand that's trying to be a YouTube presence that is going to be discovered. When you waste characters on a series name, uh, for instance, I could just put the triple S because that's what I call my series. Who cares about that? Like, who, who is searching for that? Nobody, no, no, but not even me, I'm not. I don't, I don't even take it seriously. It's not gonna be at the beginning of my headline. It's not gonna be in the headline at all. Any characters in your headline are convoluting what the average searcher is going to see, and it's also confusing YouTube. So get to your point in the first four to five words, and then don't add the episode number or the series name, because that's information people don't care about until they know you and then they might care. And then you can put it in the description section. Consider your competition and keep it simple. Always do your research for what you're trying to rank for and see who else is out there. How are they creating their headlines? How are they making it easy to understand and very clickable? You wanna be that next best option, if not the best option, so beat them. In your description, your keyword should be at the top. Try to get to it in the first two lines of the description. Why is that? On YouTube, the entire description section has fairly equal weight. You have a lot of characters. But when your YouTube video shows up in Google search, we have a different story. If you're familiar with Google search, your headline shows up, maybe a featured image, and a little bit of copy. The copy is the meta description or the first couple lines of copy in the post. This is the first couple lines of copy in a YouTube post. So if your YouTube video is going to rank in Google search, you need to make that keyword be able to be reiterated early on in that opportunistic description section. Something happened. Uh, I did add at the bottom here, you can't see it, adding additional tags here is against terms of service. YouTube doesn't like that, but just don't add tags to the description section is all that's saying. In your tags, I get a lot of questions about how many tags are good, how many is too many. It really doesn't matter as long as they are all extremely focused on what you're talking about and who you are. Uh, there have been some sources that have told me that tags are in order of importance. I don't know that I can attest to that every single time, but I don't like to, you know, give myself the raw end of the deal if I can control it. So the first few tags should really be relevant to the video. Your focus keyword should be top notch in the tags. So there you have it, all three sections, headline, description, tags. First two lines of the description, early in the headline, and early in the tags. Then go to town on how other ways this video might be searched for. Add that in the tags. Your tags can be a full sentence if you really want. Try to keep it down to three or four words so that it is very focused and you actually have a higher likelihood of showing up for that term, but that will absolutely help you. Also make sure that your information is included in the tags. The beautiful thing about YouTube now is that playlists are out and they're really making it so much easier for your content to continue playing after your video. But in order for referral content to be more likely to be your content and not someone else's, make sure every single video on your channel has your channel name, which is youtube.com slash whatever your channel name is. That's what YouTube is identifying as your channel name. 
your brand name, your personal name as it applies, people within the video that you want to spotlight, their channel names. Add that information to the tags so that you are showing up as relevant to other content, but even more importantly, when people are done watching your video, they're going to see another one of your videos. Like I said, people say, I discovered you, and then I watched 300 more videos. Well, first and foremost, it's because I'm awesome. But second, <laughs> it's because I have my channel set up that way. It's not by accident. There are technologies in place to allow that to happen, playlists, referred content, et cetera. So make sure you're setting yourself up for success with that. The tags are sneakily amazing at this. I had a brand call me and they were trying to rank for something very specific to them. Nobody could possibly be showing up in this search result except for them. The only place they didn't have that keyword was the tags. They put it in the tags, they showed up in that search result immediately because YouTube search will update very quickly. So make sure you have it in all three of those places. Does anyone notice a difference between the top two rows of videos and the bottom other than the fact that there's something telling you the difference. Custom thumbnails are what I like to call human SEO. You get to the front page of search, you have a killer headline, but so do some other people. If you don't bother to upload a custom thumbnail and you let YouTube decide what your video is going to look like for the average viewer that's now trying to, to choose an option of video to watch, and they see this, not compelling. Custom thumbnails are human SEO. They're so important. Do not take them lightly. Again, upload before end of processing of the video. Do not allow these little gems to pop up while YouTube is resetting your thumbnail. Community, how to manage a loyal community, the most loyal on the internet. YouTube viewers want to be heard. Allow your brand to benefit by listening. Isn't that a good idea? Listening. I'm sure you've heard a lot of that at these events that you attend. YouTube comments are your friends. I know that it's going to be very hard for me to convince you of that. Is anyone here afraid of the YouTube comments a little bit? Just like, mm, I'm not really trying to hang out there. Yeah. There's a good reason for that. When you don't hang out there, they're not fun to look at. People don't talk about mom when she's in the room. They talk about her when she's not there. Bad stuff, obviously. So if you want bad stuff to show up in your comments, don't show up. But if you want to share content, start a conversation, and actually have people come back, hang out. Because you get thoughtful, engaging comments. I have by far the best comment section I've ever seen on YouTube. And it's because I take this seriously. Do I reply to every comment? No. I used to. When I got two comments, yeah, I replied to every single one of them. And then I had four. That's t double. That's great, right? That's good for the video. It's good for SEO. But even more importantly, it's good for your audience. They want you to talk back even if they see that they didn't get the opportunity this time and that a couple of other people did. They just want to see that that's a possibility. Rather than being in all places, be clear about where your audience can connect with you. I personally don't think you should be on every single social platform just to make sure anywhere your audience is, they can connect with you. You should let them know where you're going to be. That's the luxury of the social funnel. You went to the old cocktail party already. I'm like, oh, that was cool, but you know what? That's not really on brand for us anymore, so we're going to be in these other spaces. So tell them where you're going to be. What I love about Twitter integration with YouTube is this. All of these are automated tweets based on somebody who has their settings on to send out a tweet when they like a video. These are the quiet advocates they may not have left a comment. They may never have left a comment. But because I linked my YouTube channel with my Twitter account, I now get an update whenever somebody likes the video and they send it to their Twitter feed. And I can thank them where they're hanging out with me off of my main platform. Pull out the quiet advocates with technology like this. 
always, always, always send people back to your home base. Always. YouTube links are great. I share them. Especially if somebody likes my video and that tweet goes out, I will retweet that. But whenever I am advocating for somebody to watch my video, they come here. They come to SavvySexySocial.com to watch. I don't care how YouTube decides to count views and monetizable views. Being on my website is monetizable for me. So pretty much this is the priority. I don't know what happened here. <laughs> Just freaking take action. Here are some of your key takeaways. <laughs> here are some of your key takeaways for uh, what we discussed today. And I wanted to allow a lot of time for Q&A because I know I talk about a lot of actionable things. So if you would like to take a few moments and step up to the microphone if you want to ask a question. Otherwise, the AV guys will have my head. Good morning. I don't want the AV guys to have your head, so I'll ask. Um, can you just review again what you talked about uh, by including the uh, channel name in the tags? Sure. So when you create a YouTube channel, you tell them what your channel name is. Now, the name of your channel might have a couple of different meanings for a couple of different people because Google Plus came into play and allowed you to rename the channel. This is how they sort of made everybody happy when they found out they couldn't change their URL names. The URL name is the true channel name. So if you were starting your channel before you decided to be something else or change the name, the youtube.com slash name should absolutely be in the tags because that is what tells YouTube that your channel content is relevant and to refer that content. Now, whatever your brand name is or whatever you named the channel, which is more uh, for viewers and for branding purposes, that should also be there too, but that's for brand recog recognition. You, you want to be able to show up and search for your own brand name. So the YouTube name specifically is a little bit different than your brand name if that's the case. Savvy Sexy Social is three words in my brand. Savvy Sexy Social on YouTube is one word. That's, that's what you want to make sure you have covered in the tags. That was similar to my question cool. about the uh, integration with Google Plus and just if you had any recommendations between uh, a personal Google Plus account and your YouTube business account and the two get intertwined and managers and things like that, anything you recommend? It's so crazy because I don't even know if my recommendation is going to apply in the long term because they're already talking about pulling them apart. But the nice thing about Google brand pages is the ability to scale your work a little bit. I don't know how many of you guys have 10 plus Google accounts, <laughs> like some, but giving out your Google account to log into a YouTube channel and be able to um, have somebody help you can be difficult. The upside to linking a brand page, in addition to verifying the channel, getting an associated website, making Google rank your channel in search, is that you can apply managers similar to a Facebook page and say, this. Uh, YouTube account or Google account is managing this YouTube account as well and that way you can have somebody specifically be able to log into their own Google account and manage your YouTube channel in some capacity. So I know that helps a little bit with the bigger brands that are trying to have their channels managed by multiple staff. That's logistically the best example, um, but otherwise you're just making Google happy and you're going to rank your, your channel a little bit better by doing that. Thanks for the question. From your 100 Periscope fans, What's Amy. up, Periscope? <laughs> Holly G Studio asks, how did you link Twitter to YouTube? It is just in your YouTube settings. So uh, there's just a place for social links in the back. It's just in Creator Studio. Um, authenticating your Twitter account should do it. OK, one more quick one. Um, do you ever share your Periscopes to YouTube? Good question. Yeah. Uh, the live stream movement is a little upsetting for me because I don't like vertical video. So, no, I don't. But I do really, Chris Ducker is a fantastic example of this. He has this beautiful graphic that he is using 
on his Periscope videos that he is sharing to YouTube. So the entirety of the HD pixels are taken up, while the video might only be a very small piece of that frame. YouTube created their platform and has built it so you can watch it on huge televisions and projectors. And your channel's even set up to be viewed in that capacity. So to go down to vertical video on YouTube is crazy town. But if you make it work with HD quality, it can actually be a huge win. Um, again, always call action to what you want to happen. But I do like that Chris has on his graphics sort of like how you can find out more about him or how you can subscribe to the Periscope, et cetera. But also remember that these are different platforms. They serve different purposes. The Periscope entirety, if you're going to hop on for an hour and take questions, not that interesting to YouTube. So only share maybe a core piece of that content in a visually pleasing place and, and way to actually make it worth your while on YouTube. When you mentioned the, the title, the description, and the tags, you said get all that done before the upload is complete. Now, we try to make our videos in advance and then release them on a scheduled day. Is it okay, will it help if we upload them to private, which is what we typically do? So we might upload five videos to private, go in, update all three of those sections, and then go public with it along with a little Twitter and Google Plus blurb. Will that be okay, or are you saying that's not going to work with the processing? I just don't like to risk it. But at the same time, when I said the first 24 hours of your video are the most critical, it's from, it's from publish point. But I know you can also, I'm not sure if you're aware, there's a scheduler in YouTube. So it, rather than pushing them in real time, I'm not sure how you're doing it, you can still upload, get all that stuff done, and put it in <coughs> schedule mode to the date you want it pushed, and then you're sort of playing it safe on all levels. Theoretically, yes, you should be fine. Uh, if you give YouTube some time to pick up that copy and it's not for a few days, at least, you should be okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi. Hey, so you suggest a call to action of driving to a home base website or what have you, which yeah. makes sense. How do you feel about call to action to subscribe below and kind of own the subscriber within the YouTube universe? Absolutely. So I think it's very important to grow the numbers that you think are most important. But if you can't monetize 35,000 YouTube subscribers, and, and I'm not talking about YouTube monetization, please be clear about that. From a business standpoint, what, what, are, those, what are those subscribers actually mean when you're depending on an ever-changing YouTube algorithm, a broken subscription box? The YouTube app just started working for me. I don't know about you guys in terms of being push, pushing notifications from, subscri from subscriptions. I think it's worth pushing it and reminding people that they can do it. But if you don't keep your core call to action in mind, that's why I at least say to social, top of social funnel, watch the content on my website. Mm. And then if they want to go to YouTube from there, they can subscribe. But I'm actually more likely to call those social uh, vanity numbers as an action after I've gotten someone on my list. So somebody signs up for my email list, they might go to a wait page before they confirm that says, hey, by the way, I'm on YouTube. Did you subscribe? Because I've got them where I want them now. And if they can help those numbers, then fantastic. But this is the number that's going to actually make me money. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. How you doing, Amy? Hi. So um, I'm a YouTuber as well. I'm the Josh Speaks on YouTube. Um, yeah. And I, do, I put out a video once a week. And I think what happens is once you start getting into the rhythm of putting out consistent videos, um, you kind of put all your focus on whatever video you're working on, put it out, share it, and then it kind of falls to the backside because mm -hmm. you're always working on the next one. Yeah. So what kind of strategies do you have for going back and revisiting old, old videos? Is it updating metadata so it kind of pops back up in search? Or is it kind of just republishing it, kind of repurposing it in different ways? What's yeah. your strategies? I think when you put so much research and everything into all of those keywords and you see something maybe fall flat, it's a good idea to go back and say, okay, why did that not maybe go over the average number that I typically get? Why is this not ranking in search? And then play with it. The, the best YouTubers are the ones that hang out in their analytics mm -hmm. because they see everything that's going on. But I also think that there are other tools that are going to help you continue to get the message out about old content. I mean, constantly I'm getting a tweet that's like, oh my god, that video was so good, or watch Amy's video from today, and it's a video from three months ago. 
because it was a tool that was helping me recycle my archives on Twitter. So I think there's a lot of ways to do it, and it's not weird for a video to become a hit after it's been live for a while because of organic push versus the search. But hanging out in your analytics to actually see where those activities are happening, happening are gonna help you be able to, to kind of revive some stuff, especially if you see an opportunity with something that's old and outdated, and you're like, oh, I can do such a much better job on that video than I did then. So I'm gonna recreate it, use annotations, YouTube cards, amazing functionality to make the video more interactive and get people to the new stuff. Hi. Hi, Amy. Uh, Matt Raymond from NASDAQ. Uh, really practical advice, so thank you. Um, for those of us working in corporations, we may not be that face for mm -hmm. the video mm -hmm. uh, or the subject matter experts, so interested in kind of your recommendations maybe from working with other brands on how we can go not only find those faces who should be on video, but also be good directors, coaches, partners, uh, for folks who may be reluctant and not want to go through the, like, the learning process or just be that person who's front and center on a platform like YouTube Absolutely. or a corporate website. I can tell you YouTube is full of video personalities begging to do more video. <laughs> so what's cool about it is that you can find so many people that know how to do what they're doing backwards and forwards from personality to editing to processing. So there's a huge opportunity with tapping into the raw talent that is already on the network. And that's what we're seeing a lot of brands do. They're just going to YouTube and they're saying, oh, Michelle Fawn, you should just be you know, the makeup spokesperson of the world now because of what you've done. But that started because she knew what she was doing and brands knew that all they had to do was give some direction. She was gonna put her personality into it and as long as she followed those guidelines, it was a good working relationship. I think the best thing that you can do as a brand ever working with a video personality is allow that personality to happen. Uh, this is where we see the most problems with YouTube networks and things right now is that they're negotiating the deals and you're making a video for a sponsor or just a regular gig and it's the expectation of how much of your personality they actually want it is different. So in terms of recruiting talent, Use the opportunity to do your research and know that however somebody is on camera is how they are on camera. And you can use that to your advantage, but if you try to hinder it, you're not gonna get the best product. Does that help? Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Hi, I'm Tracy. Hi. I'm with uh, Nail Art Club, Inc. Cool. And we do nail art. Awesome. Um, it's actually like a stick and peel. Um, but we're gonna do a YouTube channel where we could show people how to do really easy nail art. Um, so it's mostly focused on fingers. Do we have to show faces if we're just a nail It isn't group? weird to have a YouTube channel that it has no faces on it. You just are going to be at a disadvantage. Okay, so. Because people do want to connect with somebody, even if it's just the opening of the video. Okay. Uh, look at any beauty blogger. They start with the finished product, they're talking to the camera with their perfect fishtail braid, and they're saying, I'm gonna teach you how to do this today. Allow that to be not only an opportunity for a personal connection, but to show off the best part of the video at the beginning, and then go into the tutorial hands only, okay. which makes sense, obviously, in your, in your case. Yeah. Okay, thanks. thanks. Do you have a question? <laughs> no. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's, uh, we're just at 11.15, so cool. thank you very much for thanks, speaking. That was everybody. great. Thanks, everybody.